from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Library of Congress. My name is Roberta Schaefer, and I have the pleasure every day of walking through this building as the Associate Librarian of Congress for Library Services. And today, of course, you know we have an incredibly interesting and exciting program scheduled as part of many events that we are uh, introducing as part of our commemoration of the Civil War, and we hope you'll have the opportunity to go see our fantastic exhibition at some point in the next several months, if not today, on the Civil War. So without further ado, it is now really my distinct honor and privilege to introduce to you the newly seated senior senator from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, Elizabeth Warren. Hello. Oh, that's fine. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it is terrific to be here today. I want to start by thanking the Library of Congress for making this event possible. We are all grateful. This is how we all become part of history. So I just want to say thank you to the Library of Congress for putting this on. You know, I'm here today to introduce Drew Faust and Rick Burns. Now, I've known Drew for many, many years. We were much younger professors together back at the University of Pennsylvania. And we met because we were on a university committee uh, advising the provost how to run the university. Uh, think about that. Um, I, I'll tell you two things about that committee that still stand out so strongly in my mind uh, with Drew. The first is that it met at 7.30 in the morning, which was really tough for people who had children at home, as Drew and I both did. But the second was the whole notion of running a university. Um, I can say from first-hand experience that the United States Senate has nothing on universities for a combination of arcane rules, <laughs> big personalities, and a sense of how to move or not move uh, on its own vision. Um, but there was always Drew, calm in the midst of chaos, when I was about ready to light my hair over some faculty craziness, I would look over at Drew, and she would give a small smile and the quickest eye roll I've ever seen. <laughs> oh, I thought, here is a woman of great wisdom and patience. Now, Drew proved her wisdom and patience um, by her willingness to lead a great university and her exceptional scholarship. A few years ago, Drew turned her considerable talents uh, and attention as uh, one of America's foremost historians of the American Civil War to a deeply personal experience of that war. She tackled the topic of death and, cha and the changing meaning of a good death in a war that tore families apart and left a wounded nation forever changed. The result? was a moving book, a piece of history that inspires tears at the depth of the suffering and awe at the magnitude of its hurt. For anyone who hasn't already read it, I strongly recommend the Re This Republic of Suffering, Death and the Civil War. Now, Rick Burns is an accomplished documentary, uh, documentary filmmaker a writer who has already gathered multiple Emmy Awards, and perhaps it is fitting that the producer of the highly acclaimed PBS series, The Civil War, would see something extraordinary in Drew's book as she illustrates the fundamental ways in which death and suffering changed our people and our country. He thought about how to bring that to life in another way. Rick's film, Death in the Civil War, brings a new immediacy to Drew's book, and it adds a strong visual dimension to its basic themes. Together, and that's how I think of this, 
Drew and Rick tell a compelling story about the many ways in which the Civil War's horrors and tragedies shaped our nation. So I'm very happy to be here today to turn this conversation over to Drew and Rick, who will discuss the impact of death in the Civil War upon American society during and after the war and on through modern times. And they'll both be available afterwards to sign books and DVDs, but I do want to give you one warning. If you say something outrageous, you may get the famous Drew Faust eye roll. <laughs> so, Drew and Rick. On the evening of May 10th, 1864, as the Civil War ground on into its fourth straight year, 26-year-old James Robert Montgomery, a private in the Confederate Signal Corps in Virginia, wrote a letter to his father back home in Camden, Mississippi, dripping blood on the paper as he wrote from the horrific shoulder wound he had sustained a few hours earlier. Dear Father, this is my last letter to you. I have been struck by a piece of shell and my right shoulder is horribly mangled. And I know death is inevitable. I am very weak, but I write to you because I know you would be delighted to read a word from your dying son. I know death is near, that I will die far from home and friends of my early youth. But I have friends here, too, who are kind to me. My friend Fairfax will write you at my request and give you the particulars of my death. My grave will be marked so that you may visit it if you desire to do so. It is optionary with you whether you let my remains rest here or in Mississippi. I would like to rest in the graveyard with my dear mother and brothers, but it's a matter of minor importance. Give my love to all my friends. My strength fails me. My horse and my equipments will be left for you. Again, a long farewell to you. May we meet in heaven. Your dying son, J.R. Montgomery. James Montgomery's friend, Fairfax, did write soon thereafter, forwarding some of his effects and assuring his father that he had been conscious to the end and that he had died at peace with himself and his maker. But it was little consolation. Though the grave had been marked, the family was never able to find it and were thus never able to realize their fond hope of bringing their dead son home. The dead, the dead, the dead, our dead. or south or north, ours all. Our young men, once so handsome and so joyous, taken from us. The son from the mother, the husband from the wife, the dear friend from the dear friend. And everywhere among these countless graves, we see and ages yet may see. 
on monuments and gravestones. Singly or in masses. To thousands or tens of thousands. The significant word. Unknown. Walt Whitman, 1865. Nothing in the experience of the 31 million people living in America on the eve of the Civil War could have prepared Americans for what was about to break over them over the next four years. It was only in part the shocking trauma of secession itself, as the long festering debate over freedom and slavery, union and states' rights, burst into the open following Abraham Lincoln's election in November 1860 and tore the country in two. Something else would challenge Americans over the next four years. Something even more fundamental. Something different from the task of saving or dividing a nation, ending or maintaining slavery, or winning a military conflict. With the coming of the Civil War, the first modern war, the first mass war of the modern age, death would enter the experience of the American people and the body politic of the American nation as it never had before on a scale and in a manner no one had ever imagined possible, and under circumstances for which the nation would prove completely unprepared. History is full of brutal surprises that we really don't see coming. Nobody predicted Antietam. Nobody predicted Gettysburg. What the Civil War brought was this terrible modern confrontation of a set of old 18th and 19th century values with modern warfare. And the result, of course, is mass slaughter that is harder and harder for anyone to explain even to themselves. The unimaginable scale of the slaughter, the sheer numbers of the dead, would be all but impossible to comprehend. Nearly two and a half percent of the population would die in the conflict. An estimated 750,000 people in all, more than in all other American wars combined. Never before and never since have so many Americans died in any war, by any measure or reckoning. Transpose the percentage of dead that mid 19th century America faced into our own time. Seven million dead if we had the same percentage. What would we as a nation today be like if we faced the loss of seven million individuals? And so it invaded just about everyone's life in one way or another. The enormous tide of death unleashed by the war posed challenges for which there were no ready answers when the war began. Challenges so large, they frequently overwhelmed the abilities of individuals and institutions to respond to them. Challenges that called forth, slowly at first, by fits and starts, immense and eventually heroic efforts by individuals, groups, and the government. As Americans worked to improvise new solutions, new institutions, new ways of coping with death on an unimaginable scale. Before the Civil War, there were no national cemeteries in America. No provisions for identifying the dead or for notifying next of kin or for providing aid to the suffering families of dead veterans. No federal relief organizations, no effective ambulance corps, no adequate federal hospitals, no federal provisions for burying the dead. No Arlington Cemetery, no Memorial Day. The United States embarked on a new relationship with death in a whole series of ways. As a nation, it embarked on a new relationship with death because its survival would be assured and defined by the deaths of so many hundreds, thousands of people. So it would become inseparable from death in that sense. In a second way, 
the United States would develop a new relationship with death in a national sense because of the pension system, the reburial system, the bureaucracy of death that would transform the nature of the federal government. So it would become a different nation, a stronger, more centralized nation with more responsibilities, partly because of taking on these obligations that would grow out of Civil War death. But then there are all the changes for individuals who were living in a world of mourning and loss in the North and in the South, where ultimately 20% of the white men of military age were gonna die, and where everyone had lost a loved one. And so lives were shattered in undefined ways, often because so many of the dead were unknown. And ideas about what death was would be changed by the intensity and widespread nature of this experience. Certainly, as we think about the obligation of citizens to the state and what the state owes its citizens, particularly with regard to the thing that we, in some sense, is the only thing we really own, which is our own body and our own mortality. The Civil War made us rethink that definition as a country and as a people. What do governments owe to their bodies, to the bodies that make them up? And that becomes a central question in the war. In the Civil War, I think we come as a nation to the insistence that citizenship is predicated on the willingness of people to lay down their lives for the state. That's the absolute bottom line. So I think the war casts not just a long shadow, but a long sense of reality over who we are and how we deal with really those fundamental questions. You know, it's everybody dies, our mortality is assured. But the way we grapple with that reality changes over time. And the Civil War shows us that they did change and how they changed. And to be alive to that change is something that the Civil War, I think, asks us to do. different the second time, what had changed in how you saw the war, what had changed in how the nation saw the war, how was this second filmmaking venture a, a different kind of um, engagement than the first? It's funny how history doesn't stay the same and how the facts and the artifacts in some sense stay the same and have a stability, but over time you can experience the same thing very, very differently. And starting with your book, but I think even continuing to the exhibit upstairs today, I'm very, very struck <clears throat> by how much closer the Civil War feels now in the last five to 10 years than it did when Ken and I were working on the Civil War in the 1980s, 84 to, to 1990. And in some sense, we're closer to the centennial of the observance of the war in our mindset. And now we're at the sesquicentennial. And I think that we were doing the research and doing the writing and doing the interviews and editing a 12-hour series between 1985 and 1990 on the Civil War. We were flying at a certain altitude, and it wanted to be intimate at times and personal, but also comprehensive and sort of epic and synthetic in its scope. And I don't really fault us, but I think that we missed something which had something to do with the irreducible experience of what it was to be alive at that time. And it was an experience that was hiding in plain sight. War equals death. You know, it's about death, isn't it? Um, we certainly treated battles and carnage and had numbers, but I can feel in my heart that there was some way in which we did not actually, perhaps we didn't slow ourselves down. 
enough to really sit there and maybe listen even more intently than we did. And we were wrapped by those voices and the diaries and the letters. But somehow the, the salience and the transforming nature of a society of 30, 31 million people, who in, which in four years suffered, you know, is it 620, is it 750,000? We're never gonna know, and we're not gonna know for one of the reasons which your book investigates so movingly, that none of the mechanisms for dealing with death, none of the bureaucracy, none of the note taking, none of the record keeping, none of the notification, to say nothing of the burial and the honoring and the other changes, both more intimate and, and broader. And that experience, I think, I became very quickly convinced that your understanding of it was not just another understanding of it, but is an understanding which is a sort of a gateway understanding. It doesn't preclude any other conversation. It doesn't say that there aren't extraordinarily important political, military, strategic, economic, wherever you want to cut into it, there are important issues. But that as a people, individually and collectively, and everything in between, families, states, localities, institutions, enterprises, inventions, the government itself, the rationale for the state, that if you do this simple thought experiment and place what was it like to lose 750,000 people the equivalent today of which would be, as you point out, seven million in a population of 300 million. I mean, none of us, if we just lived through that experience, if this were the year that event had ended, we would be in a state of permanent individual and collective post-traumatic stress syndrome. Um, so that was really, I actually for a moment when I was asked by my colleagues at American Experience and PBS to do this film um, and work with you, I went, was it going to seem like a little bit of a retread? And it didn't, on the contrary. So I feel like I kind of went back to Civil War 101 in a very basic way. Part of what you describe, I think, was um, facilitated by an explosion of historical mm. work, in part generated by the original series, which set up such a enthusiasm of, and, and proliferation of interest in the war. But a lot of the literature that emerged in the historical record in the 1990s was about the individual experience, was about moving behind the battlefield, was about right. um, looking at a broader social experience. So I think that that also set a stage for a different set of questions. What was it like to have lived through it? And I wonder how you would see the impact of what was going on in our country in the early 2000s as we entered our decade of war and how that changed the relationship of the nation to its past as well as to the political and military imperatives of, of Iraq and Afghanistan. Do you think that's a background for some of this as well? Um, to that kind of particular emphasis on the experience and the individual. Um, I think that that's, that was something that we were very drawn to in the 80s. Mm -hmm. um, what, what didn't happen, and this is what I think was really, really spectacularly important about the work that you did, is it was a synthesizing of an entire way of understanding the war based on that experience. So that it's not just, remember, it was real men and women on home fronts and battle fronts. Here's what they thought and felt. Mm -hmm. It was the degree to which how they experienced it, how they metabolized it, whether they were dying on a battlefield or getting the news from the guy who didn't die next to their son, brother, husband, father. Um, the improvisation, I mean, the degree to which your book this Republic of Suffering, Death in the Civil War, one could be forgiven for thinking that was a gloomy topic, but the tremendous kind of creativity and um, imagination as well as fortitude that people in those situations exhibit, the way they rethink how they're gonna achieve ends, I want my son home, how they're going to confer upon themselves or their missing loved one, the good death which they want, 
to things that are very much broader. How are we going to rethink the, na the way we understand the obligation of the nation state to its citizens mm -hmm. and vice versa? And that synthesis was huge. And I've said this at this length so that I could completely punt on the second half of your question and ask you about it. Because you started this. <laughs> and it was you who was doing research as we began to move towards the circumstances which created the wars. And your book came out in the middle of them. And so I was wondering, you know, if you could answer the question how it is that <laughs> okay, the, that experience that. was sure. really me, changing the way we were understood. Let me underscore one thing, though, which is as a historian who I don't get to do a whole lot of historical research in my life anymore, um, but who spent decades looking at historical problems, I'm so struck always by what you see and what you don't see, what you think to ask and what you don't think to ask. And that's how this death project was so powerfully enlightening to me because I just hadn't thought to ask about death until suddenly I started listening to women's voices and they kept talking, Civil War women's voices, and they kept talking about it and that made me see something that I hadn't seen. So as we think about history, that question of what we see and what we don't see and when we see it and when we don't. So to come to your question about, about war, it actually was very relevant to the original Civil War series because I remember when that series came out, it was the fall before Operation Desert right. Storm and the country received the series in the context of very much so. that war. What was the impact in the early 2000s? I found that the reaction of many to the work, ongoing work I was doing, papers I was giving as I was working on the book, was very much informed by the question of what does it mean to be a nation at war? And what is the cost of war? I think that was a big part of it. Right. And, and for me, this book is about how do we understand what war costs in order to understand when we make a decision for war? Right. And I do believe that resonated as we thought about um, what our engagements should be in the Middle East. And there's something I remember from early in Obama's first term when he was trying to decide what to do about Afghanistan. And there was a report that he had gone to Dover Air Force Base right. to watch coffins coming home from the war because he wanted to really have the sense of what war costs as he made that decision. And I thought that is in the spirit of this book and that's what I want the impact of this book to be, that we should ask those questions and always challenge ourselves in that way. So does that, does that I think respond. It, it does. I now mean, you're I kind of, back on the hook. You do I it. think I recognize, you know, in that something of the change <clears throat> in which often is really um, not articulated in oneself as you kind of reach out to do a project. What what are the how how am I how are my colleagues being influenced by events in the fabric of the world I'm living in now. I mean, I think we don't often think about that, but of course it has tremendous impact. Mm -hmm. I mean, the letter for the Civil War series that jumps out and remains probably for anybody who saw that series, the letter of all letters, was Sullivan Ballou. Yeah. Um, and again, it was a, a soldier, an officer in this case, who was not yet wounded, but was about to be, um, whose body, incidentally, was never discovered I mean, he was, he, was, he was buried by Confederate soldiers in the Union Hospital tent where he died. We didn't talk about that in the Civil War. We did not talk about the degree to which Sullivan Ballou's circumstances of his death and whether or not his body was going to be available to next of kin. It was only much later exhumed. None of that was what we saw. Mm -hmm. For us, it was Dear Sarah. Because I will always, I will be always with you in the darkest day and the brightest night. That that sense of commitment and solidarity, that love can establish bonds, true enough. But that the particular circumstances under which that love was going to have to persevere, we didn't actually analyze in any more detail than Sullivan Ballou died at the first Battle of Bull Run, run one week later. And in this film, our Sullivan Ballou letter is the document from James Montgomery, which begins the film. Mm -hmm. 
and that's why we began the film with it, mm -hmm. where I feel strongly that everything in your book is in some sense vibrant and encoded in that letter, both semantically in the words, in the blood that's literally on the page, um, and in, we were talking about this last night, in one phrase of it, which I know is exactly what strikes anyone who first hears it. I write you this letter as your dying son, knowing that you would be delighted, Father, to hear from your father's son. And so we sense for a moment, boy, nobody would talk like that now. Under what circumstance would a father be delighted? And how are is they there like any? Us? Is and there how any? How are they different from us? And then you go, right, there would be a circumstance under which the father would be delighted. If, for example, it was routine not to hear anything, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as opposed to routine to say, mm -hmm. Dear Mr. and Mrs. Smith, we regret to notify you. Mm -hmm. So the delight is very real, but you have to do a little work to get to, to it. it. And you're first struck back and then pulled mm -hmm. back in. And that sort of the heartbeat of that, the systole, diastole of going, whoa, delighted? Of course delighted, mm -hmm. is I think marks the difference between kids working on the Civil War 20 or 30 years ago and this particular project where it just something else is now brought into a very different focus. <clears throat> when I was doing the research for this book, I came across an uh, element of the history of death in the Civil War that I had had no idea of before. And that was the post-war burial movement and the effort by um, the Union government led in part by a man named Edmund Whitman who figures very prominently in the end section of this film to locate the bodies of the Union dead all over the South and rebury them in national cemeteries. 300,000, more than 300,000 bodies were reburied and about half of them were identified. And this is a, a wonderful part of the film and it has visuals that I've never seen. I mean, it's just a marvelous uh, element in, in the story you tell. But that was something no one had really been interested in until we began to say what happened in how the nation reacted to its obligations to the dead. So that was something that you don't see until you look and you don't look until you think to ask. And, and so that was part I mean, of it. Right. I mean, Appomattox in our series comes in the last episode. Appomattox comes in your third to the last chapter of your book and comes 40 minutes, 45 minutes before the end of our two hour film. Because I had not, as I think most people had not, stopped to think about what was it like to have a predominantly southern landscape littered with hundreds of thousands of unburied, scantily buried, recently re-exhumed, desecrated graves. I mean, the statistic that, that jumped out when I first read your book from Whitman's sort of, basically it was a Whitman-esque, a Walt Whitman-esque journey. Mm -hmm. Let's first just count it up. Let's number it. There's no other way to deal with it. Let's figure out where they are. And so the quartermaster general sends out Edmund Whitman and his colleagues to basically just do a fact-finding mission. And what you discovered about Edmund Whitman's fact-finding mission was extraordinary. 40,000 dead bodies between Vicksburg and Natchez. That's an 80, 90 mile stretch of American landscape. If any of us walked out to First Street right now and saw one dead body, it would remain stark in our experience for the rest of our lives. So they're finding 40,000 dead Union soldiers, many of them above ground, many of them in graves that have been washed open. Like how does that affect a country? What do you do with those, just in the most the basic logistical ways? And so that sense that, sure, Appomattox, Durham, North Carolina, hostilities cease by late April 1865, but you've got a country which is sort of littered with dead people and ha having to come to terms with what they're gonna do with that. It was an incredible story, and that it's not a story that, I mean, how did you find that story? It was, was it recherche? Was it, I mean, how did you come across Edmund Whitman? I remember very well, it was in this city. I, I wish I could say it was in the Library of Congress. It wasn't, but it was in the National Archives. <laughs> and I was sitting there reading this journal of a trip and in, to the Western states, essentially, of the former Confederacy. And I started reading this thing, and I thought, this is unbelievable. And it was Edmund Whitman's report, official right. report, uh, to the quartermaster general about going and, and looking. And I didn't even know what it was. It took me a long time to figure out who had written it, because it doesn't say Edmund Whitman on the front, because it was an official document. So that made that connection. And 
here unfolded this extraordinary story. And from my point of view, there was an extra extraordinary thing about it. I began to wonder, who is this guy, Edmund Whitman, and where did he come from? And so as I traced out his life and went backwards from this moment at the end of the Civil War, I found out he'd come from Kansas. He was older. He wasn't usual Army age. He was in, in his 40s or late 40s. He'd come to Kansas to fight with John Brown. He was an abolitionist. His concern about the dead was part of a kind of human rights concern that had begun out of his anti-slavery views. So I began tracing him back. Class of 1838 at Harvard. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know if that's destiny or coincidence or, or what, but it was, it was a treasure hunt in a sense, and it, it, it's an extraordinary story. And that particular, um, he, his, the questionnaire that he published to talk, talk a little bit about that. It's just an amazing moment because it, it connects actually the experience both of the dead and dying on the battlefield and those who happen to know who they were, who have this knowledge unactualized but sort of potent in their thoughts and memories and letters. It's, it's like a post-Civil War internet right. that gets created. And there's an example of one part of this upstairs in, in the exhibit where Clara Barton here in Washington is trying to find out information about the many, many, many missing men about whom loved ones have no information. And ultimately, we think about half the Civil War dead were missing and never identified. So just think about all those families desperate for information for decades after the war. And yet, Clara Barton realized, as Edmund Whitman realized, and I'll talk about his context in a minute, that somebody must have information. If a person died, there was someone standing next to him on the battlefield, or some person had dug a grave for him, or there just was more information than it was possible to get hold of in any very direct way. And so she published lists of names from an office here in Washington and asked, and one of those lists is up in, in the exhibit. Do you um, know this? Do you know these people? Yeah. Can you give us any information about them? And Edmund Whitman started doing the same thing under a kind of official auspices saying, send in anything you know uh, or any information you might have about soldiers who were lost in this western part of the South. And what he found was that there had been a nation essentially of record keepers, people knowing that it mattered and yet not having the established processes to record these deaths and in spare time, um, soldiers would write down descriptions of graves and just keep them, thinking someday they would have somebody to give this to, to whom it would matter. Chaplains would record camp graveyards before the, an army moved on in order to have some record of the ground they were abandoning. And so Edmund Whitten became a, a kind of uh, information um, recipient of all this data that people sent him, and he used it to find a grave one mile from the railroad uh, south of Chattanooga under an apple tree. You'll recognize John Jones or John Smith or Bob um, Heller or whoever his name was because you will find that I buried him with some distinguishing artifact. And so Edmund Whitman very carefully went back and did all of that and it's just, just tried to honor every single um, piece of information and match it with an individual who could then be found. So it's from, and it's from that work, which I just found so, and you can see his letters. I mean, there, he's got the letters where our camera is seeing the letter. And there's the picture of the grave by a little cartoon pear tree and the description. So he's following it exactly there, and it's from that that Whitman is writing his superiors and say, we have a higher duty, yes. we, the American people and our government, to find these people, to bury them in protected graves, to honor them and say we'll never forget them. And so, to have a national cemetery system ultimately. And to have an at 70, 70 odd cemeteries yeah. around the yeah. South by the 1870s. So that's what I mean about it's not just this is what it was like to be at the war. This is how this experience had this tremendous generative, volatile power in it mm -hmm. because it's so important. Mm -hmm. And just as that word delighted is so disconcerting because it doesn't fit with our assumptions. So I found when I began to look at this material, the notion that we did not have ways of 
identifying the dead, being responsible for the dead, burying them in honored spaces. It was astonishing to me. And I'd been reading things about the Civil War for, and living in this country and all the rest of it for my whole life. And that I didn't know that was shocking to me. Right. And the implications of that and how much changed in such a short period of time to create, during the Civil War years, to create the assumption now that we owe this to our um, service people who have sacrificed in, in behalf of the nation. This is a national obligation. Which we this, can't imagine. It's a it can't imagine that it, it wasn't seem, so. It seems like an yeah. immemorial commitment yeah. and obligation. Yeah. But, but, but as, as our colleague Mark Samuel said, go try to find a Revolutionary War cemetery that was started by the national exactly. government. There is no such thing, an 1812 cemetery. So Rick, we're gonna open this up in a minute, but I wanna ask you one other question first, which from another direction. There's been a lot of conversation in the past several weeks about the films nominated for the Academy Awards that were um, based in some way or another on history, and a lot of discussion about what level of accuracy does a historical film need to sustain um, what is historical fiction? You do something else, you do historical documentary. Right. Could you just talk about how you think about that a little bit and what is the obligation of someone representing the past in film or in, in writing too? I guess there could be that implication. But as you think about it in film, how did you react to all of that conversation in the press and how do you think about your mission and your obligations when you um, address the past? It's interesting because it feels to me that historical films, I mean, dramas, Lincoln, um, for example, maybe preeminently, you know, that we've made really huge, it's a fantastic film. I mean, it has, people can argue about, you know, flaws in it or not. Um, does it go on too long after, at the end? But that there's something in it that lives for a historical documentary filmmaker, lives at, in its production design, in the words that Tony Kushner you know, used and partly transformed and partly just pulled wholesale out of letters and diaries and manuscripts, that the tremendous moving power of the real stuff lives in a film like Lincoln very, very potently in a way that a historical nonfiction filmmaker can really, really relate to. And what I know is that the contract we have as nonfiction filmmakers, as historical documentary filmmakers, is basically something like this. And everybody gets this. It's not rocket science. This is true. That means it really happened. We are going to, in the way we present this, get as close to the truth in every conceivable way that we can. And sometimes we're going to fall short. There isn't a photograph. So that when you see that wagon wheel, you know that wagon wasn't actually going west. When you see you know, the flickering fire um, at, at Appomattox, you know that nobody had a film camera there. But you also know that there's something about that reality, which the filmmakers in good faith are saying is going to bring you closer to the experience of what it is to be there. And so it gets back, very much back to what we were talking about, getting close to experience. And there's a truth to experience which is related to objects, artifacts, facts, interpretations which have been certified and supported by the data, but also has to do with some authentic attempt to close your eyes and say, what really was it like to be there? And I think that any historical documentary filmmaker I know, I'm sure would agree, 98% of the work you're doing is in trying to create the experience not get the facts right, order them correctly, get the interpretations, have people say things powerfully on film about it. That it has to do with, you know, movies really happen, whether they're fiction or nonfiction, not up there on the screen, big or small. They happen in the dark interiority of people's selves. And the reason why I find it so humbling and challenging a discipline is that while you can kind of arrange the images out there, use this one, not that one, longer, shorter, pretty easily. Because you can see it. It's hard to see what's going on inside somebody. And since the movie's really happening there, and that's where the experience, that's where fact, data, object, diary, word, are becoming literally reanimated. Some other human being remote in time and space from James Robert Montgomery, or his father, is now considering this document 
and thinking, what would I feel like were I writing that? What would I feel like were I reading that? And that's the chain of events which you're, quote, controlling, and I put it in scare quotes because it's very hard to control and you have to feel it and use your own insides as a first version of somebody else's insides as you go along this. And so it turns out that at the end of the day, I feel that historical drama and historical nonfiction are very, very close. Because to be powerful and memorable and therefore to have been worth the cost and time and energy and money and even the investment of an audience member, it has to ignite that thing. There has to be a spark that jumps off the page, jumps out of the bleeding letter, and the spark begins there and then something like a pilot light goes on in here and if it connects, then it's happening. And that's what you're following. That's the red thread that you're following desperately, kind of frame to frame. Keep that going. So it's really about what your book was about. It's about experience. And how do we join experience then and there with experience here and now? And the thing is crucial, but the feeling, which is voluntarily given and conferred, has to be part of it. <clears throat> and I'm so struck by how much emphasis in that answer you placed on the audience, the recipient of the film, the person who will be moved, will be brought closer to the past. Do you think in a very self-conscious way about what moves an audience or is this some intuition and gift that makes you such a great filmmaker? I mean, did you find when you first started doing this work that you could just intuit it and you could make decisions about what the right thing was and it worked? Or do you sit and say, all right, what am I gonna use here? This you know, as important as genius is in the, in the equation, <laughs> um, I had the for good fortune of sitting next to my 18 months older brother, Ken. That's kind of where I learned how to do this. And Ken has many qualities, um, all of them extraordinary. Um, but one of his most striking ones is he can sit there and watch the same section of footage in a film. And if it's, you know, he's like Shylock. If it laughs, it makes him laugh. If it's sad, it makes him cry. He is the first member of the audience for his film. So there he is, he's heard the goddamn joke 10,000 times. And he throws back his head and roars with laughter. Or if it's sad, he kind of gets a little bit verklempt and has to turn away. And people who are, first time people are kind of brought up close to this, go like, what the hell is this guy doing? But what he is, is he is being the first member of the audience for his movie. And knowing that if it doesn't happen, it doesn't matter what you wanted it to be, what you hope it will be, what it could possibly be. It matters, does it actually leap up? and touch something. And so I think that the only, you could, you have, you, every gift you bring to it is good. The only gift which is absolutely crucial is to be a sounding board and to be a relatively true sounding board. I mean, I've had the embarrassing experience of laughing like a donkey at a scene one afternoon and then coming in the next morning and looking at it grim faced and going, it's really not funny at all. So your sounding board can be off. But basically it has to be relatively true and reliable and that if it doesn't work for you, it's not going to work for anybody. And so that's the, that's the instrument that, that you use. So it's not, there's no, there's no rocket science to that either. But it's also absolutely the, the thing. I mean, I, I, I can remember literally the days and weeks sitting by Ken. I saw that and went like, that's the thing that you can't, it would be very hard to teach that if you weren't watching it yourself. You'd have to, you have to see it and understand that that's the, um, that's the nitroglycerin that's in a little bottle that you've got to keep and hold dear. Because without that, you won't make any connection, no matter how much research or how much money or how much time you spend. So should we let them have a chance? Or do you want sure. to talk about something else first? Um, yeah, let's let them talk. Let them have a chance. We can start. Do you want to call? Over here. Hi. Yes. 
Hi, uh, this question is for Rick. Um, I wanted to talk about J.R. Montgomery's letter. Um, you may or may not be aware that that letter is also featured uh, in the first room of the Virginia Civil War 150 History Mobile uh, with a dramatic reading of it. And it's a four room exhibit and they start with that letter. And I find it interesting that your film starts with that letter as well. And so I just wondered if you could talk more about your choice in choosing that letter uh, to, to begin your film. You know, you know, it wasn't just that Drew Faust wrote a wonderful book, um, This Republic of Suffering, um, which we based our film on, that's true. Um, the research she did was, turned out to be most of the research we had to do, so we followed her steps. Um, whether it was to Edmund Whitman, whether it was to the Museum of the Confederacy in Richmond, where the J.R. Montgomery records are kept, including that, um, that, that letter. Um, and, you know, for me, the kind of aha moment of our film, and I, I would understand why anybody would wish to um, and think it potentially powerful to start an exhibit, a talk, a slideshow, a film with that letter. Because if Drew's right, that you have to go to the experience people are having. Sure, there are all sorts of economic forces, things that can be quantified, um, abstracted, described in, you know, sort of the, the big forces of history. All of those are operating. But the fact is, is that for all of us and for all human beings at all time, we live our life from the inside out. All those forces are operating on us or through us or in us or in relationship to us through what we think, what we feel, what we eat, what we want, what we fear. And that when that experience, in this case the experience of war and fragmentation and death, hits a society so dramatically that they begin to rethink everything from who is my God, what is the afterlife, to what does the country owe its people and what do the people owe its country, then you want to start with that salient experience. And if there had been a document or a phrase or an object or a photograph or a bullet or a mangled piece of you know uniform that spoke more eloquently and more immediately than James Robert Montgomery's letter we would have started there to say let's not give you an explanation an explanation first let's give you a core sample of an experience may 64, Spotsylvania Courthouse. I mean, all the details are basically right. The sun was going down. You could hear thunder and battle artillery in the background. He was dying, sort of finishing, bleeding out. And there are his words. And that you want to start from that. It was almost as if it was a scientific experiment. If Drew is right, then there's no better way to start this than just put your hand on James Robert Montgomery's hands and think about it for a minute from his eyes or the eyes of anybody who, who had the opportunity to see that letter. So it just was, and it was revelatory because you look for the beginning of a film, long and hard. And you, I have never had the experience that you know in the beginning what the beginning is and that it's the thing that changes more than any other thing in a film. And when you find it, you literally burst into tears because you've been, because it's a performance happening inside people's selves and souls. And that first thing, the A bead on the necklace, and then there's a B one and a C one. That A thing, if they're, if you're, if they're there, if they get it, if they care then to continue to B, C, D, you've established the most crucial, critical thing. And if they're not, you've failed. So there was just a kind of an aha moment which then seems so self-evident in retrospect that you go like, why didn't I think of that in the beginning? But it, some of those self-evident things I've found humbly take a very, very long time. You do feel like a monkey with a Rubik cube. Um, I, I love it. The film begins with that letter, and I didn't know Rick was going to do that until I saw the film. And I love it because it is about what my life as a historian has been most profoundly about, which is how manuscripts speak. And if you 
go to the exhibit upstairs, there are a lot of manuscripts in that exhibit that speak. And for this to be the linchpin of this film, to make this manuscript speak so eloquently, and to make it a visual experience, and to capture an audience into that letter, I just, for me, it said a lot about the subject of the film, but it also said a lot about how one does historical work and how one is most fully connected to the past. So for me, says this thing where some things that happen are, are so horrific and so huge, and we all have this experience, that you go, did, wait a minute, did that really happen? You know, September 12th, did that really happen? I remember vividly waking up early in the morning of September 12th, 2001, and kind of as my consciousness recollected itself, and then included that. I went, what did it really, really happen? And I think with the Civil War, the reason why I know for me, I think for many people, um, it's kind of like anything which is an, uh, uh, an authentic trace of what happened, a photograph, a letter, a diary entry, a bullet, you know, sort of all that stuff which can seem almost fetishistically close to gotta see the real thing. Oh, was that gun really at Gettysburg? Is that a nick that really took place at Spotsylvania? Has, you know, sh to be sure it could sound a little bit like, you know, kind of antiquarian, obsessive, compulsive behavior. But what it does is it, it, it's, this, it's almost like Freud's compulsion to repeat. It brings us back and makes us go, right, it did actually really happen. And that's why I find the art of the war difficult and the photographs, the greatest artistic achievement of the 19th century, collectively, the Civil War collection of photographs, because they testify and they say, sure, they staged the body, they, didn't sh they had their own artistic ambitions. Mazel tov. There's the body. It really did happen. We know it happened. There's the blood. It's all, in a funny way, a version of Montgomery's blood on the page. It makes it, real. it makes it real, and then we have to start from that, rather than from what happens with all horror. The mechanism of denial is so huge that we turn it into a story, as David Blight is so eloquent at describing. And the greater the horror, the more powerful the storytelling mechanism. And then we discover that we substitute a narrative for a reality. And what's been so sobering and transforming in the best possible way for me, returning to this experience has been returning to the reality, unadulterated, so to speak, by the narrative that we want to place on it, whatever that narrative might be. <clears throat> okay, this question's for Dr. Faust. Um, I was just wondering if you could talk more about your process for coming up with a conclusion about the citizen state contract. Um, I wrote, a paper comparing your book to Benedict Anderson's Imagined Communities, and I favored your book, obviously, over his. Um, and I was just wondering if you could maybe talk about your process as a historian like, that you used to come up with that conclusion. That there was a contract between, that there emerged a contract between the citizen like, and the state? That there's a contract between um, like your, the citizen to the state and then vice versa, the state to the citizen. Mm -hmm. It emerged in considerable part from the public discussion that surrounded the reburial movement and the establishment of the national cemetery system. The kinds of language in the bill, the kinds of conversations and debates that preceded those um, pieces of legislation, the press talking about, um, it's a long section from a, a piece in, I believe it's uh, in Harper's, where an essayist um, is emphatic about in a d war for a democracy and a war about the kinds of goals the Civil War had, we have to have a new understanding of the dignity of those who participate in the war. It's not just about fighting a war for human dignity, it's about fighting a war that itself honors principles of human dignity. And so the combination of the rhetoric that surrounded these actions and the actions themselves seemed to me to embody a dramatic shift in perception and understanding that was then reinforced by um, formal 
acknowledgement of this obligation in the National Cemetery System and the investment of national resources, uh, people time, funds in supporting that very changed set of uh, parameters. It is also accompanied by the evolution of the pension system, which we haven't talked about here, but that sense of obligation to the families of those who fought and the enormous bureaucracy that surrounded that. This is not something the United States had known how to do before. So they didn't just say, well, we're gonna do one more thing. They had to change their whole way of thinking about what government was in order to take on these obligations. And that, for me, underscored how significant it was because it did require them to act so differently. Does that respond to you? Thanks. Yeah. I very much want to thank you for both producing the narrative visually as well as um, your book, President Faust. I have a couple of questions, if you don't mind. Uh, one of them, as a, I'm something of a historian of the Civil War as well, and I'm curious about what you found in the documentary, personal papers, things like that, with regards to whether death in the war on such a scale shook faith, for example. Also, because Mr. Burns actually introduced the idea, what's the next life like, and so forth and so on, was there a sort of existentialist riff, or was it a reinforcement of faith, and so forth. And also, whether there were any sorts of perceptions on the parts of the families and so forth, that a lot of this was for them. I mean, a cemetery, if you believe in faith of any kind, isn't where the deceased is. And so it's really a remembrance place to go back to, to commune with your lost one and so forth. And I wondered what kind of of uh, potential recognition of those kinds of issues you found in your research? There was a lot of consideration of those issues. One of the quotes that for me embodies it most fully is Sidney Lanier, a Southern poet's saying of the war, how does God have the heart to allow it? And that for me kind of sums up a question that not just Sidney Lanier, but thousands of other Americans were asking themselves. How do they sustain a belief in a benevolent, caring, engaged deity when they see this horror all around them? And so it requires a certain revision. Well, maybe God has some larger purpose that we haven't quite figured out. Or maybe God is more distant than I thought he was, and he doesn't care about every sparrow. He has large designs, but every sparrow may not be part of what he concerns himself with. Part of the response to the first way I posed the question was, God must have larger designs, and therefore we must make sure this war is about something that matters, and that we take from all this bloodshed a commitment to creating something that is lasting and worth all this loss. That, in essence, is Lincoln's formulation in the Gettysburg Address. Um, to say that all of this, he doesn't put God in that particular part of uh, rendition of the equation, but it often was framed in terms of divine purposes for the nation or for humankind in light of all this cost that had been incurred. Uh, so that was one response. I also found a lot of um, speculation in individuals' diaries about losing faith, um, Southerners who said, if we lose the war, then I can't understand how there can be a God, and, and the very foundations of my faith have been shaken. In most cases, I found these people returned to one kind of belief or another, but I think it required a certain revision of understanding. They had anticipated that their cause was just, they would win. Um, God would make them win. Both sides wanted God on their side. Lincoln was wiser. He said, it'd be nice to have God, but I've got to have Kentucky. That was a good... <laughs> a good uh, way to frame it. Um, so I think he understood. Well, in the second inaugural, he talks about how both sides think that God was, was their sponsor. So how do we understand all of that? And, and his second inaugural is another response beyond the Gettysburg Address, one that's much more rooted in religion about what the cost of the war was and why it had to be paid. 
So searching in, in the realm of religion and belief for an explanation is very widespread. Um, you asked about heaven. There's a lot of speculation, a lot of books published about heaven and the nature of heaven at this time. Uh, an effort to make heaven seem less cold and austere and distant, uh, less forbidding, something that seems more comforting to those who are thinking of their loved ones having gone there. Spiritualism is an expression of this too. So in all the realms that you're talking about, there's a, there's a great deal in the, in the documentary record. Yes. I want to thank both of you. Again, add my voice to thanks to both of you for the wonderful work you've done in helping us understand some of the deeper meaning of the human tragedy of war. And I want to ask Dr. Faust and perhaps Mr. Burns if you have information. As a small part of that revised contract between the people and the government, what happens during war and what is the reciprocal relationship? And you've talked eloquently and shown us eloquently what happens with burial and reburial and creation of national cemeteries and officially honoring each dead person. Back to the sub-question of the identified and the unidentified dead in the war. How quickly did we move to a system in which the army uh, routinely supplies to every combatant an indestructible identification tag? We know that by the Second World War they were ubiquitous. I don't know about the wars in between. And, and by the Vietnam War we can't even find an unidentified soldier to add to our tombs in Washington. But, but between 1865 and 1941, what did we do about identifying every soldier in an indestructible way? Um, dog tags is a sort of shorthand for, for the question you're asking. The Spanish-American War it was still rather spotty and incomplete. By World War I, there were systems of identification that were fairly complete. So that, that would be my response. Do, do you have? I mean, certainly the impetus to know and the sense that there's an obligation that is a national obligation was firmly implanted by the war and the degree to which it was then implemented bureaucratically right, was something that took subsequent conflicts to animate it and bring it to life. But there's no question that you have that sen this very strong sense that, that the government is going to, pr it's why the Gettysburg Address is so crucial to us as a, doc as a document, as, as a handful of words, because it articulates what the nature of that obligation is and makes it seem unrescindable. And also so compelling that we just nod as we nod at a hymn that means a lot to us. And it's because at the center of it is the best conceivable articulation of what that obligation is. And it goes both to those known and those unknown. And I think it's so striking that of course in 200 odd words, Lincoln wasn't gonna name anybody by name. But in a sense, by not naming anybody, he was saying that the fate of being unknown not known to is in a sense the peculiar modern condition now of death and dying in war. And it hadn't happened that much before. Now it's happening on a big scale. So we can't rely on friends, family, the known twos to gather around the dead and as Thomas Lynch says so beautifully in our film, you know, get them where they need to go from where they fell to the hole in the ground or the tree or wherever they happen, their, their ceremony takes them. That the Gettysburg Address is this extraordinary, not just articulation of the responsibility, but it is like a funeral dedication, saying all these people known and unknown now have a collective known to, a collective parent called the government who get a government that gets its authority from the people and therefore 
owes an enormous amount back to those people. So whether we literally knew them, whether we never heard of them, whether we literally have their name, but might not know them anyway, we are going to take upon ourselves this obligation. They're not individual deaths anymore. They're not they're individual the deaths, deaths that belong to the nation. Or they're right? deaths as in, they're individual insofar as they're yeah. individual, but they belong to the nation. Mm -hmm. And that dynamic is what your book is so kind of amazingly carefully charts over this very compressed period. How did it come about that if you said he died, the address of that phrase was a wife, a mother, a father, a brother, a friend, a colleague. Now you say he died and the address is the entire nation. Mm -hmm. What an amazing transformation to take place. And the tact of the president to have been able to, with, as you point out, the bodies in the coffins by the open graves at Gettysburg. So that when he says, from these honored dead, we'll take increased devotion. We must take increased devotion. It's not an abstract set of bodies. It's these guys over here in those boxes, not yet put into the ground, without knowing necessarily who they are. That it's kind of indescribably fortunate to have had somebody who could articulate and move the country towards that sense of permanent higher obligation. And we have time for one more question. Uh, you spoke quite a bit in the book about um, the importance of the, the good death the, the, to um, the soldiers, to those who are around them, and, and most importantly to their families, that they died one with God, that they died bravely. Um, do you think that attitude is, is something that was a reflection of our culture at the time? When did that sort of attitude start, and when did we no longer have that attitude? Well, it was very much a part of um, Christian religious tradition in the United States, but it had originated in as early as at least the 16th and 17th century with instructional books about how to die well. And these ideas were broadly shared and then reinforced in 19th century Victorian domestic culture by a whole set of expectations about the home and what the home was supposed to be and why the death needed to be located in the midst of that very Victorian home. So it had a particular expression in the mid-19th century, but it was something that was much broader in its, in its understanding. I think it still exists to a considerable degree. Um, I was very struck in, in 2000 when my father was dying in a uh, part of the Winchester, Virginia hospital, not too far from here, 60 miles west of here. They had a special section for, it was like a hospice. And they created the good death for my father. And we were there, but it was extraordinary to see the interaction of how the hospital staff was thinking about supporting us as, as much as him and what that, those moments meant. And I sat there at the time, in the middle of working on this book, thinking about all these soldiers' deaths that I'd read about. My father was actually a soldier in World War II, so in some sense that seemed all, um, all very consistent. But I kept invoking the language in my head of what I'd read from the Civil War period as I experienced in the early 21st century, first year of the 21st century, this death in our own time. But what differs strikingly in our time, I think, is that we try not to think about death during most of our lives. We try to deny it and put it aside. And a big part of the good death in the 19th century was making your knowledge of death and the end that will come to your life a powerful force in how you live your life and shape your life. And so that acknowledgement of the ever-present reality of the limited nature of our existence was central to 19th century Americans in a way I think it's not so much in our time where we want not to think about it until we have to think about it. So that's probably more than you really wanted to know in answer to that question. <laughs> so we're done. Thank you very much. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.